Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 10. I have seen travail. Now the Bible describes travail two aspects. It's a reference to the tribulation period and a woman given birth. It's labor with pain. I have seen to travail which God has given to the sons of men. Well, there is one part. Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, we see the travail given by the devil. And then we see travail given by other men. And then we see travail given by ourselves. To be exercised in it. So travail is an exercise. It's a strength building. Paul says that he was given the thorn in the flesh and he and he sought the Lord three times and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. It was a thorn given to Paul for Paul's edification to keep him from sinning, to help him. The only time God would really give us travail for a hurting, would, but it's also a learning, is Hebrews chapter 13, when he corrects us when we do wrong. Now, when the devil does it, he does it to destroy and to conquer. And then when man does it to another, again, that would be, you know, when a man impregnates a woman and she's going to have the travail. When a man causes some kind of uh, issue to another man that causes great pain and sorrow. And then we, we of our own sins cause our own travail. He that made everything, God that made everything beautiful in his time. So in reality, there's nothing ugly. It may be become ugly because of sin and iniquity. The Bible says that Lucifer was a beautiful created cherubim. Then iniquity was found in his heart. Rebellion was found. And then he became. But even still the Bible says that there's beauty in him. God made everything beautiful in his own time. Also, he, God, has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work of God. I mean, the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. There are things that, you know, God has set forth into our hearts, a distraction, unknowing, not wise enough, and lack of understanding that what God has made beautiful, what God has done for a time, man doesn't understand. There are parts of God's creation of all, the universe, the earth, and everything. There are parts of God's creation in the doings of God that we have no idea. There are parts right now in my own life I look at and I I don't know what the end is. I don't know when the end is. You say, well, you just repeated it. No, I, I'm saying, I don't know what the end work is and I don't know when the end of my life is. I don't know if, if I got a minute, if I got a week, years. And then when my time is rapture or death, I don't know what purpose, what God's doing today for the purpose of tomorrow. I know that there is no good in them. But for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. Solomon, worldly, in the, in the, in the tense of philosophy. Do good. And every man will come up to you when you're in a public ministry on good. 
But there's a problem later on that comes up. That the Bible says there's none that doeth good. In the aspect of God. And it was written in the scriptures. What is good? The Bible defines what good is. And also that every man, every man, saved or lost, should eat and drink. That's what every man does. Enjoy the good of all his labor. Every man's to work, every man's to eat, and every man's to drink. And enjoy it. Is that a place today and, and a woman's doing her job? And, you know, we all complain about our job, but you know, I've been here forever and enjoy. Now, I'm not going to say I've been completely at a job and I'm wonderful enjoying. No. That's what Simon tells us. It is a gift of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ. And he tells us labor and to eat and to drink is a gift of God. That's what God gave to Adam. He made Adam and then he put him to work. And he said, you have all the food and all, all the fruits and all the, the water and drink and attend to my garden. And then he gave him a wife, a help me. That goes all the way back to Genesis 2. He did not want man to be idle. I know that. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. Again, Psalm is writing under the sun. He has not been given the revelation that the earth is going to burn up with fervent heat. As Solomon looks at it right now, everything that God has done is, is going to be forever. And man can't change it. When God has prescribed in whatever testament, whatever uh, dispensation he is in, when God has prescribed a way of salvation and a way of damnation, you're not going to please God if you're the way of evil and wicked and destruction and sin. No matter what, you're not going to please God. You can't change that. And though another way, you know, we're all sinners, and even Solomon writes, all is sin. When we try to do everything that God wants to do, and we have that perfect atmosphere of trying to do right, and adhering to whatever God has set forth in the dispensation of that time, we will go to a heaven, we'll go to eventually new Jerusalem, new earth, or new heavens. And you're not going to change that. You're not going to look at somebody who's in the new heavens, new Jerusalem, or new earth and say, well, I don't like him. I don't think he should be. It ain't based upon you. It's God. I mean, what if we were to take the, the vilest and wicked person and... They get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they go into glory. They done what God told them to do. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And evidently there's going to be some kind of complaint. Because when Jesus tells us the parable of the, of the vineyard. And everybody went out during the whole day long for their penny. And the ones at the end of the day who got the same penny that they agreed to, <clears throat> they're expecting more than the people who showed up for one hour. You got your penny, they got their penny. Well, we're in disagreement. Well, God settled it. 
that which has been is now that which is that which uh, and that which is to be has already been and god requires that which is past and what we're going to get into the next few verses is there's a judgment coming and everything you have done that is now past, you'll be judged. You're not going to be judged what you could have done in the future. Whether you die, rapture, whatever. You're not judged on tomorrow. You're judged a minute ago to all the way back to your birth. Whatever is past in your life, you will be judged. It is sin set now. But there is a way you can change now. You can get righter by obeying God. And have really a good outcome of hearing well done. Or you can get worser. And it may not be words, I apologize. By doing wrong. And the outcome won't be very good and well for you. And moreover, I saw under the sun, looking again, the earth, earthly, world. I saw under the sun the place of judgment, courtrooms. Solomon would look at his golden ivory throne, and that was a place of judgment. He sat there with two harlots judging. That wickedness was there. So there's a place of wickedness. The wicked will be judged. And a place of righteousness. That iniquity was there. Solomon says, under the sun, worldliness. Living as a man. I saw the wicked go to judgment. And I saw the righteous go to judgment. Do you know at the judgment seat of Christ where saved Christians only will be? You know there's wickedness there? There's iniquity and sin? That's wood, hay, and stubble. Do you know that at the great white throne judgment, there is righteousness there? There are things that people have done that was good. And I said in my heart, God shall, shall judge the righteous and the wicked. So don't think today as you're born again, Bible believing Christian, don't ever think God's never going to judge me. I was judged at Calvary. Yeah. But what have you done since Calvary? For there is a time, for there is a time and there for every purpose, for every work. All right, now the work, let's look at the evil man. Revelation chapter 20. I need to look up another verse here. Uh, bear with me real quick. So, all right, Revelation 20, we're talking about a work. And verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, that be Jesus Christ, God, whose face the earth, the heavens fled away, and there was no, there was found no place for them. There's the judgment, the great white throne judgment. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the, dead and, and the dead were judged, that's what we've been talking about, out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. 
And the sea gave up the dead which were in, it, were in it, and death and hell delivered the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. So there's coming a time at the great white throne judgment, people will be judged for their works. Now, if their name is not found in the book of life, verse 15, they go up into the lake of fire no matter what they did. And if their name is in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life, whatever works they've done, they will go off into eternity, the new heavens or the new earth. There are saved people at the, at the Great White Throne Judgment if their name is in a book. Noah, Abraham, Adam, Seth are going to show up here at the Great White Throne Judgment. No Christians are at this judgment. And they're judged by their works. Now, when we go to 1 Corinthians 3, let's look at the Christian judgment. And Christians will be judged. I, I think some Christians think, oh, I'm, I'm saved. I'm not going to be judged. 1 Corinthians 3, verse uh, 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, and the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And, by, and the fire shall try every man's work. Abide which... He has built there, he shall receive a, a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. Back to works will be judged. Now, I'm not saved by works for salvation, but after I've been saved, whatever I've done for the work of Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stone, crowns, well done. Inheritance. Everything I've done not for Jesus Christ and I've done for self, wood, hay, or stubble, those works are burnt up. I, I'm still saved, but I don't get any reward for wood and hay and stubble. Now, all the people who are who are at the great white throne judgment, their works will be judged too. And their cause for salvation is, is their name in the book. Every man, what he does for God or for self is going to be judged. Solomon knew that. So we do see in the writing of Ecclesiastes, we do see a heavenly touch as a worldly point of view. Because Solomon tells us nothing of heaven or hell. He just says the righteous are going to be judged, the wicked is going to be judged, and they're going to be tried by their work. He's looking at a earthly, worldly court. I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Naturalism. Evolution. Brute, beast like. Nebuchadnezzar takes it really full. There's an evolution phrase right there in Ecclesiastes 3 18 as, as count of the man right and from under the sun. You know, we're all beasts. We have the nature of beasts that we just want to eat, we want to drink, we want to conquer, and we want to make babies. But we are not a product of evolution. We are a product of God, the creator. And there is a difference between humans and bees. But there are men that act totally brutish. And we see that word brute in the Bible meaning animal-like. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth the beast. Even one thing befalls them as the one dieth, 
so dieth another. Also, we're not looking at evolution. You know what Solomon state his evolutionary cause? You know, you know what he came to the fact is? A lion dies. A dog dies. A cow dies. An ant dies. A mouse dies. Men and women die. Man, we've already seen him explain his death. The, the, the greatest wisdom, brightest guy, the richest, wonderful, wealthiest guy, and the most stupidest person, the most foolish person, they die. Now he says about man, we die just like the animals. Yea, they have all one breath. You breathe the same air that a pig breathes. And birds and dogs and cats. A rat. You got a mouse in your house or mice and roaches, you're breathing the same air they breathe. So that a man has no preeminence, superiority above a beast. Now, all right, God told Adam, you have authority over the animals and told that to Noah. So what is the contradiction of Solomon? There is none. Solomon is writing in the in the kingdom of animal of animals and humans, we get we got one thing in common. Like the wealthiest rich man and the poorest beggar. As the most smartest man and the most dumbest man. We got something in common. We all die. Where is the super, where is the super, where is the superiority? A man can kill an animal. And an animal could kill a man. And Solomon's giving it the earthly, worldly thing is wow. You know, you can find roadkill inside of a road and realize that somewhere a human was hit by a car and died too. Really deep stuff here. But we can't take what Solomon's writing to us in the book of Yankees and build a doctrine upon it. Oh, see, he says we come from animals. No, we don't come from animals. That's not what he said. He said us and animals, man and animals. We die. Well, see, you know, we got to go save the whales. We got to go save. No, it's not what it says. There is there is a superiority God set forth in Adam and Noah. Man over the, man has control over the animals. Solomon is saying, man and animal, we die. And the animal could die the same way as an as a man, and a man may die the same way as an animal. That's vanity. That's nothing. What? Wow. All go to one place. Now, what do you? What? What? If you read that, what do you think that means? That means all dogs go to heaven. Your cat that got hit by a car is going to heaven. That, that, that's how they read it. They stop there. Judge not, least you be judged. And they don't take the context. You would think, they all go to one place. What is Solomon saying? What is the writing of the book of Ecclesiastes? It is under the sun, a man looking at the world with his human eyeballs. One place. What is that? The dirt. Uncle Louie, Uncle Louie died. We buried him in the ground. Fifi died, and we buried him in the ground. My father, King David, died, and we buried him in the tomb. Rehoboam's pet bird croaked, and we took the and we buried it in the ground. That's vain. 
We spend thousands of dollars to bury a person. And you can take a pet canary and put them in a box and bury them out in the backyard in the in a flower bed. And there are some people foolish enough to, to spend, you know, in a pet cemetery and all that nonsense. Yes, I say it's foolish and I say it's nonsense and oh well. All are of dust. And all turn to dust again. I don't think so. I think Solomon is not giving a little wisdom here. The bee. Now he's beast. He's talking about cows and they're come out of the ground. Look at Genesis chapter one. Not all animals come from the ground. Remember on the standpoint of what Solomon knows. So I'm in Genesis two. Genesis one. Verse 20, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life, the fowl that may fly in the earth, and the open firmament of the earth. Marine animals and birds did not come from the ground. Right there. Now, I don't know if Solomon had a copy of Genesis 1, the law he was supposed to. Look at verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Let the earth bring cattle. The mammals, the land animals came from the ground. Not the marine animals. But when we go back to Ecclesiastes, Solomon said the beast. He didn't say the, he didn't say the, uh, the, the fishies. He didn't say the birdies. He said the beast. The beast would be cows and reptiles and giraffes. And so what class of animals is, is Solomon talking about? The dust of the ground, the land animals. He's not talking about birds and fishes. That defies evolution because evolution says we come from the marine life. Marine life, Genesis chapter 1, came from the ocean, came from the water. Dust and dirt, he said that, you know, we're all like beasts. Look at verse 18 at the end. Might see that they themselves are beasts, not fish, not birds, land animals. So verse 20, and all that go in one place, all are of dust, all turn to dust again. That's what God told Adam. Dust thou art, and dust thou shall return. Solomon knows Genesis 1, and Solomon knows Genesis 2, and Solomon knows Genesis 3 by those statements. We are created beings. We are not beasts. We are like beasts. And we have one thing in common with the beast. We're going to die. And the beast, Genesis 1, are land animals, not sea animals where the sea animals came on the land and started walking that's not what the bible says that's not what the godly philosopher of the bible says who knows the spirit of man that goes upward and the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth take your bibles to genesis chapter 2 And you make this statement, and I've gotten family mad at me for this statement. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to teach you what people believe are wrong. Genesis 2. Okay. Verse. Um, Verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, you see what Solomon just said, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, there's spirit, 
and man became a living soul. Fish don't have that breath. Genesis 1, God the creator, the author, says no evolution, said man, God breathed into man and man became a living soul. That's the spirit. Psalms 104, 29. Psalms 104, 29. Let's see what the Bible says. 104, 29, I think I did. That thou, thou hidest thy face, God, they are troubled. Thou takest away the breath, they die and return to the dust. That's your body. God made the body out of dust. God breathed the breath of spirit into life, and man became a living soul, body, soul, and spirit. Now look, who knows the spirit of man that goes upward? That breath that God gave you goes up. Saved or lost any dispensation, any man, your breath, when you die, returns back to God. What's CPR? They're trying to put the breath back into you. When you die, the spirit comes out, it belongs back to God. And it goes up. And the spirit of the beast goeth downward to the earth. Animals don't go to heaven. That breath that God breathed into man goes back to God. The breath of, of Fido, the breath of a uh, uh, little fluffy goes down into the dirt. That's the difference between man and beast. You're not going to find your pet in heaven. And that's going to anger a lot of people. When I take my last breath, my breath is going back to God. When a man has repeatedly, repeatedly rejected the gospel that I preach, when he dies, his breath goes back to God, lost. God owns your breath. If you're going down the road and you run over a cat and it dies, straight down goes that, goes that breath. When a lion attacks a, a, a deer and kills that deer or the antelope, that, that life goes right into the earth. There is no salvation or going to heaven for animals. The only animals you read about in heaven is those horses coming back in Revelation 19, and you don't read about any animals thereafter in Revelation or anywhere, except for the four beasts, the lion, the ox, and the eagle. Those are the cherubims. got to take what the Bible says. Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better that a man should rejoice in his own works, what you do, what you do for God, what we read, what Solomon hasn't seen yet. And yet Solomon can also be speaking about God because he did some great works for God and he did some great works for the flesh. For that is his portion. And what we just read in 1 Corinthians 3 and what we read in Revelation 20, your works. You see, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, my works will get me rewards. If for Jesus Christ. My works for myself gets ashes. They have nothing. Well, maybe your works at if you go into the lake of fire at Revelation 2, maybe your maybe you get maybe some works, but you haven't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have not obeyed the law. So your works don't mean nothing. 
as you go into the lake of fire to pay for your own sins. Now, what about the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints and those before the law and those in the millennium that show up there? Let's say they do things for the Lord. You mean they don't get a reward but just the Christians? That's not how God works. And if that man has his name in the book of life and he's got good works, he's going to be rewarded. Everything that was done for God. And whatever he's done for self, just like the Christian, burnt up, but not him. And if we do stuff, and we do works for the Lord, rejoice in it. We have a promise. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Your children, your work, your, 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 whoever. Or maybe Solomon is trying to get that little life after death. What will your works produce after you die? Solomon don't know. But he knows you'll be judged by your works. And for the Christian, not the works of salvation, not the works least any man boasts, but by grace are you saved through faith. And yet James writes to us, faith without works is dead. Oh, we are in great doctrinal battleground of Christians and scholars and in the realm of Christianity. But that's what Solomon tells us.